Well, anyway, uh, again, it's good to be with you guys. And I was just thinking the other day about uh, coming to you and just figuring out what it is that I, I would like to speak about. And as I did that, I realized that there's, there's really only one thing that I want to speak on, and that is us, the church, and who we are. You know, um, God has made each one of us special and unique. Every human being has around three trillion cells. Wow. That is an unbelievable amount. Some of us have more than three trillion. But anyway, somewhere around three trillion. The older I get, the more I get. I, I don't know. And around 60% of all of our cells are composed of water. That's just an amazing thought to think about that we're, uh, maybe that's why I like fish, especially catfish. I don't know. Uh, it, I have thought about it and, and just the, the, the very act of breathing every day. We breathe about um, seven or eight liters of air into our lungs every minute. That's around 100,000 liters in a day. You never think about it that way, do you? God has made us in a marvelous way. He's put us together in such an interesting combination of things. Some of us even have as many as 76,000 hairs on our head. Some of us don't, Frank. <laughs> But God has even made sure that we knew that He knew how many hairs we had on our head. Isn't that amazing? Our God is so great. We, as we just sang, He is awesome. He is beyond our understanding and He always will be. And He always will be. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. Paul wrote this letter to a group of Christians there in Thessalonica, a, a city that when he first went there to Thessalonica, the leaders of the church um, were few. In fact, there was only uh, several people who accepted Christ during the time that he was there. And, but the city leaders and the Jewish leaders at the synagogue didn't like anything that he was preaching. And it was so bad that they were ready to kill him. And if it wasn't for a few of those Christians who interfered and stopped the mob, they would have gotten him. And he snuck out of Thessalonica and went on to other cities because he realized that he could not do anything there with the hostility that was there about him preaching about Jesus Christ. He preached that Jesus was the one that God had sent. He was God's son. He was actually God. And that he lived on this earth for so many years and he had disciples and, and that the rulers of the day crucified him on a cross. And that the sins of everyone in the world were placed on Jesus Christ on, at the cross. And when he died and was buried in that tomb, all of our sins were there with him. And held him there until the third day when God's power rose him from the grave. And he walked around and he, many people got to know him. Over 500 got to hear him speak. And then he was raised up and went into the heavens. Those who heard this testimony of Paul became extremely angry. Their gods didn't do any of those things. The Jews said there could never be a son of God. There could never be something like this. However, there were a few there in Thessalonica who listened and believed. And the Holy Spirit came upon them in such a way that we find in, in this letter to Thessalonians, the first letter to Thessalonians, we find that Paul is saying to them, you have done such a great and marvelous thing over the years as the church, for you have spread the message of Jesus Christ across all over the area. And everybody who's heard you have, ex have listened and many have accepted Jesus Christ. Wow. This is the kind of church 
that Paul was writing to. A church that he said, I, I really and truly want to be there with you, but I can't be there because of I'm in, he didn't say this, but he was in prison at the time. So he couldn't get there. But he said, oh, how much I want to see you face to face and just, and just be with you and be with you as a church. And so we hear these words at the very end of his letter. Chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians. Just a few words here that he wrote to them that I want to, us to think about today. Rejoice always, evermore. Verse 16. Verse 17. Pray without ceasing. Verse 18. In everything, give thanks. You might say, wow, that's an interesting statement. Those would have been great statements to use at the very beginning of a letter. But he used them right here at the very end. Why did he do that? Because they were the most important thing that this church in Thessalonica could do. He was saying to them, these are the things that you need to be doing. What were they? To pray without ceasing. To, to give thanks every day. And to rejoice in everything. To rejoice in everything. I have some notes here if I can get them right. I was thinking about how I rejoice. I rejoice because of my conversion. My accepting Jesus Christ and into my life. I was 20 years old when I accepted Christ. I accepted Christ because I had heard a message. It was a song message. It was called Tell It Like It Is. And this group of young people, mostly high schoolers, were singing and I heard it. And I listened to what it said and it said, If you would reject the sin in your life and come to Christ, He's going to give you a brand new life, a different life, a life that is no more like the life of your, that you had. I, I couldn't imagine what that was, but I knew that that's what I wanted. And I knew that it was time for me to make a decision to accept Jesus Christ. And I, and I did that. I really wasn't too sure what it was all about, but as I began to grow in Christ, I began to realize there were several things that were happening in my life. And let's go to a, uh, over to uh, this letter again to the um, fourth chapter and, and verse 7 and 8. Here's what it says. For God has not called us for the purpose of impurity, but in sanctification so he who rejects this is not rejecting man, but God who gives His Holy Spirit to you. I had to think that through many a time and think through what it was that God was saying to me. He was saying, reject sin, all the impurities of your life, and start moving towards Christ. Start doing the things that Christ would have me do. Start being the person that Christ wanted me to be. To become sanctified. To become holy. I couldn't do that myself. But He put His Holy Spirit within me. As He did within you as a Christian. And when you are a Christian, the Holy Spirit is within you. And the Holy Spirit is leading you towards being holy. Being completely His in every way. Being, being totally pure in Christ. Totally pure in Christ. I had no idea what that meant and I had no idea what it could mean. But when I began to be a part of a church that the whole church longed for that. The whole church wanted everyone to be pure and holy. I began to realize that this was something that none of us could do but we could have fellowship with each other, we could encourage each other, we could pray for each other, and we could teach each other. And guess what? God began to do a work in my life that all of a sudden all those sins that I had in my life, I realized were sins that I was not, that was not a part of my habit anymore. They became things that I didn't have to do anymore. 
They became things that I could reject. Paul was very excited about these Thessalonians in that they had become pure people. I didn't know what I had up there. Jesus was very interested in, in doing that. He was very interested in, in getting us to the point of being his disciples. Next slide. Now, now, there you go. And, and he died for us. And he died for us because he wanted us to be like him. He was sinless and he wanted us to be sinless. Is that possible? Well, let's, let's look, go on. Let's go a little bit farther. He also said to the Thessalonians in, in uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 and 7, He said that you guys need to be imitators. You also became imitators of us. He's talking about Paul and Silas and Luke who were there. They all became imitators of Paul and imitators of Jesus Christ. They begin to do the things that Paul did. They begin to do the things that Jesus did. Because they learned from Paul all about Jesus. And it says, from us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much tribulation, because there were still people in Thessalonica who did not like the Christians, so they were in turmoil as they were starting up in all that tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit upon them, in them. They were excited because they knew that the Holy Spirit was doing a great work in their life and in their church. So that you became an example of all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. So they became like Paul. They became like Christ. They became those that others could imitate. They became the example for other people. They became not only the witness, but even their deeds were deeds that people would note and realize that these are people that are different. In fact, we know that later on in the, in the next centuries that Thessalonica became one of the places that we consider to be one of the first locations of a hospital. What would be, what we might even call a modern day kind of hospital. A place where people could go in and, and be nursed back to health. It was among these Christians that this started. And why did it start? It started because there were so many plagues going on through the Roman world at that time. And Nobody wanted to be around those plagues. In fact, they fled to get away from anybody who might be uh, impure, who might have some kind of disease. And they didn't know how to deal with it, so they just got away from them. But you know what happened? Those in Thessalonica who were Christians, they went to those who were with disease, who, were, who had the plague. And they went to them and they nursed them back to health. Many times, they died from the plague also. And you know what? It wasn't just the, the dads went to help out or the moms went to help out. They took their whole family with them. And whole families perished in the plague. But as they did that, through the third and fourth century, more and more people came to Christ. Why? Because they said, these people are so different from everybody else. They're living a life that nobody can even understand. Why would they go to a plague city and help those and nurse them back to health. Leave them alone. Get away from them. That's what everybody else does. That's what the world does. But you're not. You're going in there to take care of them. Of course, that's exactly what Christ would do, would He not? It completely revolutionized that New Testament world. And guess what? Many people came to know Christ. And Paul is saying to these Thessalonians, thank you so much for being an imitator of us, being an imitator of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your, your example is being spread across everywhere. I was with... Uh, uh, Alex Fleming the other day. Alex is a, um, uh, a new pastor 
uh, of a church. He's also a new daddy. Uh, two weeks ago, he and his wife adopted their uh, foster child that they had had for about nine months. And so I was with Alex yesterday, and he was still beaming over the fact that they had adopted this little girl who's now nine months old. Uh, they've had her ever since she was a day old. And they were so excited, uh, so excited. But he is so excited also about the church that he started about, about six months ago. Your church is helping them do that through the association and through the Baptist Journal Convention of Texas. Alex Fleming is, is someone who's, who, who had a pretty rough life. Uh, in fact, he was a felon, convicted, had to go to prison. Got out of prison and realized that he had a group of people that he could reach for Christ. Who were they? They were ex-felons or ex-prisoners. Inmates had come out and he started a church down by the county jail in San Antonio. It's called Life Restored Church. And I said, well, how's it going, Alex? He said, every week one of these ex-offenders accepts Jesus Christ. He said every time it is absolutely amazing. It's a man, sometimes it's a woman, uh, sometimes it's a, it's a young person that's 17 years old, just out of a, a, a a teenager correction facility comes over there and accepts Christ right, right in their midst. And he said it's all the time. God is doing a marvelous work there. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit loves to bring about great things in the church. He, he wants people to come to Christ. He's constantly working on bringing people to Christ. Let's go on with this. Ephesians. I mean, uh, I keep saying Ephesians. Thessalonians 4, 9 and 10. Not only did, did, did the God want us and He put His Holy Spirit in us, but verse 9. Now as the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write of you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. This is an amazing statement. He is saying, it's not something that I have to go around and teach you. I don't have to be writing you letters to say, please love one another. In fact, God is teaching you to love one another. And not only love one another, but let's go on. For you yourselves were taught by God to love one another, for indeed you do practice it toward all the brethren who are in all of Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. This is the kind of church that Paul was writing to. A church that did exactly what Jesus prayed for in John 17. Jesus prayed that the church would be united and that they would love one another. And that's exactly what Paul is saying the Thessalonians were doing. They were, they, were, they were not saying, you know, what about you? What about, you know, well, you're not exactly that. We love each other first. We love each other first. We take care of each other first. If there's any kind of problems that are going on, we work on those together. And we, and we find a way to find a solution to them. That's the kind of person that Paul was, 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 as he thought about who they were, he realized that they were people who were being taught by God himself. Colossians went on to say, he wrote to the Colossians in, in uh, verse uh, 27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, that's, the, that's the, what's going on in the Thessalonican church. Not only is the Holy Spirit in, in each one of them, Christ Himself is within each one, motivating them to do things that they could not do alone. So when we talk about how do we rejoice always, we rejoice because the Holy Spirit is within us. Not only that, Christ is within us. Not only that, God has called us to be His people. We're together because that's what Christ wants us to be. He has called us to be His church. And when we are in tune with Him, doing what He would have us to do, our witness will go everywhere. And everybody will know that we are a group of people who love Jesus Christ, who love each other, and who care for each other. And 
we rejoice because of it. And they see it and they say, this is not the world. You shouldn't be, you shouldn't like your neighbor. You should be upset with your neighbor. They put up a fence right there. You shouldn't, you, they, they always park the car out on the wrong side of the road. No, stop fussing about that. Love your neighbors. Take care of them. And sometimes love the members of your church. No, all the time. Rejoice always. And then the second thing he said was pray without ceasing. I have a, uh, a, a Muslim family that lives right across the street from me. Nasir is uh, 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 an engineer. He uh, uh, became an engineer at, at Berkeley in California back in the, in the 70s. Uh, he's lived here in the United States all these years since the 70s. He's from Afghanistan. His family was more or less were all pushed out of Afghanistan. They're now living in, in Pakistan uh, by the Russians when the Russians came into Afghanistan. Uh, history. You don't, you don't have to figure out that at another time. Anyway, um, and he, he's a Muslim neighbor across the street. And so we, I, I invited him the other day to go out to eat with me. So we sat at a restaurant talking and visiting and talking about uh, all kinds of things. But in the middle of all that, he said, tell me about prayer. You see, what had happened was his wife had cancer, had gone to the hospital, and later on she was out uh, doing things, and my wife had visited her, taking her food and all this kind of stuff. We're out in the, in the driveway with, this, with, with, with Nasir's wife, and they were sitting there, and I was standing there talking, and Susan said, can I pray for you right now? And she said, sure. So they prayed right there. And then afterwards, Nasir's wife said, you know, you don't pray like we pray. We pray. We have a place inside of our house where we pray, and, and, and we have to be on our knees, and we have to be facing a certain direction, and we pray five times a day. And Susan said to her, well, you know, we don't do that. In fact, what we do is, we can pray with our eyes open, we can pray with our eyes closed, we can pray standing up, we can pray sitting down, we can pray kneeling down, and we can pray all the time. So there I was sitting with Nasir the other night, eating a meal together, and he said, tell me how you pray. Tell me how you pray. And I said, I pray all the time. I never stop praying. And he said, aha. Now, that was more or less all of that conversation. But where is he going to go? I don't know. I'm hoping for the day that Nasir accepts Jesus Christ, that his wife accepts it, that their daughter and granddaughter accept Jesus Christ, that their son-in-law accept Christ. I don't know. But I'm slowly, Susan and I are working with Nasir and his wife to help them understand who Jesus is and how do I do that? By conversation with Him. And visiting with Him and getting to know Him and having a good time with Him and finding out that, you know, the kind of tea that they drink from Morocco is very different from the tea that I drink. But, hey, we have a good time together. Pray without ceasing is something that only a Christian can do. You see, the Jews, they went to the temple once a year and waited for the high priest to go in behind the veil and come out and say that God has accepted our offering or not. They did it once a year. The Buddhists pray, to, pray hoping that somehow or another, that the more they pray, that somehow or another they will become good. The Muslims pray that they will go to paradise. And that's about all they're going to pray. The Hindus pray to all the different gods that they have 
for any illness, for any situation that's going on, they have a different God to pray for, and they pray for that God, for that whatever that illness is or whatever that situation is. We Christians can approach God's throne every moment of the day and night for any reason that we is on our heart that we want to ask God about. You know what? We're, we're not really, it's not really praying as, as these other religions do. It is communing with God. Not just communicating with God, but communing with God. Letting Him take over our life. Letting Him speak for us through the Holy Spirit. Many times we're praying silently, are we not? And when we pray out loud, many times it's out of the exuberance of the love that we have for God that we begin to pray. Have you ever prayed just driving down the road, hopefully with your eyes open, uh, and all of a sudden you just break into saying, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Have you ever done And you just say, Well, what do I I can't even think of why I'm saying these things, but the Lord does it. He loves us. He wants us to be excited about worshiping Him. And the only way we can do that is through communion with Him, where He takes over. Boy, i got a lot more to say and not enough time. Here's what I can say, guys. We rejoice always, without ceasing. In everything we give thanks. But we realize that we cannot quench the Spirit. It is possible for us to do that. It is possible for us to pour cold water on the Spirit's fire. But we cannot do that. Instead, we must let the Spirit burn in our, in our bodies. Be all that it can be. There are some hindrances. Shallowness means that we have a lack of earnestness. We're not really earnest about what we're doing. Insincerity means that we have a broken motives, wrong motives, unbelief, a lack of confidence in the love of God and the faith that we have with Him. Slothfulness, a lack of being willing to actually move in a direction that God would have us to go in. To become sanctified. These are all things that hinder our lives and these are things that Paul was writing about. Please start doing these things so you don't have to worry about these hindrances. Again, what are those things? Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. And always give thanks. God is the one who has called us. God the Father. Jesus Christ is the one who redeemed us through His blood. God's Son. The Son of God. God's, God is the Son. God is the Father. And God is the Holy Spirit. Indwelled in us is the Holy Spirit. We must daily ask to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Every day. I could get into that. We must confess our sins all the time. And He's always faithful to forgive us our sins. We must stop quenching and grieving the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit work in our lives. And then we will be those joyous witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That's who the church can be. And that's who the church is. But it means that you, as a group, as a church, have to be willing to accept those conditions. To rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and to be glad about everything. Well, that's not hard things to do. In fact, they're pretty easy things to do. But you know what they mean? They mean that we, as a Christian, when we do those things, we're actually going to be telling the world that we are different. 
We are people who know who Jesus Christ is. And we want to share it with you as soon as possible. Some of you here do not know Jesus as your personal Savior. Many of us here have accepted Christ and have brought Him into our life. We, we realize that He is the one who died for us, for our sins. He's the one who covered us with His blood. He's the one who has kept us from the raft of God. And now, He is the one who wants you to come to faith in Him also. This church has an opportunity for you who, who would like to accept Jesus Christ in, in what's called an invitation. Some of you have, would like to rededicate your life. Say, I, I want to start living my life as one who, who is rejoicing, one who is praying, one who is thankful. And you'd like to rededicate your life. This is the time to do that. Some of you would like to be a part of this fellowship of believers. And this is the time for you to join them today as we.